So my name is Charles Dale, and I go to Leo Hayes High School. And we just wanted to express our gratitude for being able to attend, attend this event today. There's a fair amount of us from Leo Hayes, and I know there's a few from FHS as well. And we want to thank all of you guys and all the speakers today for making us feel welcome and allowing us to give our questions fairly and openly there. There's been a few great ones that I know have been posted by us. Also, I want to thank our teachers who have worked so hard to ensure that we had this opportunity to come and that I know that if youth and high school students and Leo Hayes students come to events like this in the future, we will provide a different point of view, a new scenario and a new youth opinion. And a forum like this is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. My uh, manager tells me, my stage manager says we're uh, running tight on time, so no draw prizes for now. We're going to move on. I'm going to introduce uh, Harry Forrestell. Um, he's the afternoon moderator, so he's the next professional speaker to get up here and I can get off. Um, he has a career spanning more than 20 years uh, in, in media, and uh, his, um, he's been a freelance reporter for the Parliamentary Press Gallery in Ottawa. Uh, he's covered uh, breaking political news. Uh, for local CBC radio uh, before pursuing a career as a producer of morning radio programs. In 95, uh, Harry moved to London, England, where he worked as a science and uh, medicine correspondent for several international broadcasters, including BBC World Services. Uh, his work uh, for CBC Radio Quirks and Quirks earned him two awards for the Canadian Science Writers Association. So we're very pleased to have Harry here for the afternoon. He's a very appropriate moderator, uh, given the theme of the day. Harry, please join me on the stage. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Oh, I don't need to walk to the microphone. I can amble across the stage because I'm already mic'd up. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. What a great honor this is, and a great collection of people uh, from all ages and uh, sectors. Um, as was mentioned, I used to be a science reporter. That doesn't mean I understand anything about science or anything about anything, only that I enjoy asking questions. And uh, of course, the key to asking questions is to make them as simple and straightforward as possible if you want an answer that's going to be understandable to the average person, the lay person. So I hope I can uh, help with that here today. Um, our first presentation is about security intelligence, and it's going to be presented by Dwight Spencer. You will know him as the uh, co-founder and the prin and, uh, principal solutions architect at Q1 Labs. Now, after uh, Dwight's presentation, uh, we're going to take some questions, your questions, and we'll be seated here on the couch, as has uh, already happened throughout the course of the morning. And uh, we hope to get some interesting, compelling questions and some equally interesting answers from Dwight. Now, in a province best known for wealth and natural resources and industries uh, based on their collection and their sale, true high-tech success stories still attract a lot of attention. Our next speaker is at the heart of one of those stories. Earlier this year, every major business publication and tech journal reported on the sale of Q1 Labs to IBM. It was a transaction that left many shareholders happy and certainly delighted directors of the Provincial Government Pension Fund. While it is based in Waltham, Massachusetts, Q1 is very much a child of this province. Our next speaker can take much credit for that. Dwight Spencer is a co-founder and a principal solutions architect at Q1 Labs. Prior to that, he held positions with UNB, where he was, by the way, a graduate of the Department of Computer Science. He has also held positions with Industry Canada's Community Access Program, Teleeducation NB, and SmartForce. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome our next speaker, Dwight Spencer. Thanks, Harry. Everyone can hear me okay? I guess so. Uh, just to start out, my name's Dwight. Uh, I just want to apologize. Sandy couldn't make it today. Uh, it's kind of funny. When Sandy, we all started Q1, um, Sandy became our CTO. We were we always kind of, were, what's a title mean? So CTO, Chief Technology Officer. We kind of changed that to Chief Travel Officer. You're called out in the road today, so he couldn't make it. Um, oops, clicker. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. So as Harry said, I'm one of the uh, founders of QN Labs. It's been a great 
experience for me dealing with um, customers, uh, dealing with a startup project within the province, and I must admit I'm a little nervous today, I apologize. <laughs> um, and it's been 10 years since we've been doing this. I started originally in Q1 Labs as one of the developers, one of the founders, um, working with Sandy and Chris Newton while the project's being developed. And from there, moved into the sales organization, supporting our customers on site. And from there, I found a really strong need for customers to get a really good experience with the software and with the product. So my goal at that point was then to make sure that all of our users had a great experience. So I moved into the support team. Uh, you can see across the bottom here, I tried to theme some of the pictures. When we first started, I was kind of disorganized. I had mud all over my face. I was kind of disheveled, kind of like I am right now. And from there, we learned how to deal with customer issues, make sure they're happy. So I've kind of gotten better paired along the way. And we built a good team at Q1. The company started in roughly, I would say Chris Newton actually started working at the university in 1999 and working on the project shortly after the university had res wired up the residences. They found that they were trying to figure out what was happening on the network, couldn't see what was going on, but performance was really dropping off. So that's kind of where the roots of the company came from, very local problem. Uh, I would say probably about a year after that, Chris came to Sandy and I after he had presented at some conferences. A lot of interest from other universities wanting to try the soft route, and Chris thought, this is a good idea. There's a lot of interest here. Maybe we can make a business of it. So we started working then, uh, got involved with a local entrepreneur from St. John, and worked for about the next 18 months building out the company, building the team. You can see here the first pictures, Sandy and I and Chris, and that was probably our first Christmas party of 2000, 2001, and just built it out from there. Um, the team has kind of built out since then. We've taken on investments, we've taken on a bigger team, and kind of moved on and progressed until what we are today. Security intelligence. The concept of security intelligence is to understand what's going on within an environment, within a network, to try and make sure that you're abreast of the issues that are happening, keeping track of what your users are doing, what they might be involved in, making sure that people aren't getting into problem areas of the network or get exposed, that kind of thing. As an example, some of the customers we've worked with over time, they've seen very distinct issues. For example, like a lot of the times during a customer trying out our software, they will get a return immediately on deploying the software, trying to figure out what's going on in their network. They can see that some of the users are hitting sites they shouldn't be, uh, accessing networks they shouldn't be on, receiving messages and things like that. Um, just an example, one of the customers here, they had been infected with the here, ha you're here you have virus worm. And they found that they couldn't necessarily see what was going on. There was a lot of, like a lot of reaction time involved in trying to figure out what the problems were. That was an example of one customer issue. Uh, another one, we have a large customer, Chevron, has huge amounts of data that they're trying to analyze. They deal with an um, um, enormous amount of information. They've got data centers and they've got networks around the world trying to scope out what those problems are in those areas. It's, it's, a, difficult pro it's a difficult problem that they need to figure out what the responses are. That's where Q1 Labs comes in. We can take this, these, these disconnected sites, these disconnected pieces of information, amalgamate them into one center, one application, and give them an analysis of what's happening. Uh, another example is uh, commercial institutions, where they're very, very concerned about loss of information, loss of intellectual property, for example, we've had some customers report that during the process of developing a product that some people may come and leave the company and they need to protect that information. So the product will help them monitor that kind of activity, see what's going on, verify that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, another example, a large manufacturing company, Cargill, they have another, another customer that has data centers around the world. They 
originally were involved in monitoring their physical infrastructure. They were very concerned about people breaking into their facilities, breaking their manufacturing plants. But in today's day and age, they've become very concerned, like you guys were mentioning this morning, that the world is becoming more and more connected. There's more and more systems out there that are exposed on the internet. And they're very concerned about what new vectors of attacks may occur. For example, like control systems within manufacturing plants. More and more of these systems are becoming automated. Sorry. <laughs> becoming more and more automated and they have, these networks are also controlled by their own corporate internet. They have accesses there. So as attacks change over time, those systems are exposed. So for example, where you may have had at one time uh, somebody attacking a manufacturing plant would have perhaps done some physical damage to the environment. They now have access to the internal structure of the organization or the internal structure of their manufacturing plants. And they may be concerned with maybe that those systems are being compromised, that they'd be vandalized and maybe lose control of their internal manufacturing systems. So that leads to very different kinds of security issues, but very much prevalent security issues all the same. Back when I started at UMB in 1990, attacks that took place were very much, very, very low level. Like, or not even as much low level, but very, they were very different from what they are today. For example, denial of service attacks. People may remember the name of the Mafia Boy that attacked various sites throughout the internet. For example, he took down Yahoo, took down eBay, took down the New York Times. But those were pretty much brute force attacks. They were basically, I actually read the story this morning just to refresh my memory, and what he had done was he had actually set his system at home to start attacking these networks. And didn't really think about what he was doing. But he went to school and left it. He come home to find at the end of the day that he had seen reports online that some of these services had been locked offline. He's going, I think I did that when I left for school this morning. So it was, it was very, uh, very different than what's happening today. For example, a lot of the attacks that happen today are much more focused. Well, I was reading about uh, an incident this week um, that, I'm just gonna skip to the next slide here. I'm gonna ask a couple questions. Um, who here uses Facebook? I should see 86.2% of the hands go up, more or less, I think. Um, LinkedIn, for example, is another environment. Um, who here does online banking? Probably a very good population, yeah, very good percentage of the team here. So one of the things that you kind of have to think about when you have an online presence or when you're using online services is the security around those. If you think about the passwords you use, do you use different passwords within different locations? Do you use the same password for Amazon that you use for, say, your online banking? Do you use the same password that you use for your social media website for another service. I don't know how many people here might use Gmail, but something I just noticed in the last week or so, if you log into Gmail and you look across the top banner, they ask you, are you using the same password here as using in other locations? So one of the things that you think about, okay, big deal, what's, what's the big deal there? Some of those services, not to say that they're not secure, but they have different security levels. So what's happening is that the attacks that are happening today, they've changed very much in complexity. So whereas, as I said, Mafia Boy made a just denial of service attack, took these sites offline, didn't really care about the, the implications of that or the effects, what are happening today is they're much more targeted, much more focused. So for example, it's revenge is one of the new themes of attacks. Monetary gain, they might be taking out financial systems. Espionage, political activism, and even more so, national security. Um, we have a, some, of the, some of our customers are in the critical infrastructure, as Dr. Grubani was saying this morning. They have critical infrastructure systems that are now being brought online for just ease of use, ease of access, and ease of information and managing those systems. But what possibilities are there for a very determined attacker to get into those systems and have an impact? So for example, you knock a website offline during a denial of service attack, it comes back up in a couple hours after they've blocked your access to that site. But if you were to say, for example, to get access to the electrical network, the electric control network system, 
as I leave was saying this morning, that the impact of these attacks is much different today than what it was then. So for somebody to take down one of these networks and shut off power for the eastern seaboard, it's not just 10 or 15 people or 10 or 15,000 people that are affected, it's millions. And what's the impact of that? You gotta think about that when, when this kind of thing is happening. So you think, okay, it's my password, yeah, I'm not gonna affect anybody, but as you progress, you kinda of have to think about what's, what are you involved in, what are you doing in the future? If you set these practices now to make sure you have secure systems, you'll think about that in the future. One of the examples I was going to mention um, is called HB Gary. It's a really good example that of shared common password systems. Um, this is a federal government uh, military contractor that was involved with a lot of government contracts. And there was a very targeted hack that went on there that somebody went into their, kind of like their social media forum support website and was probing their their application, trying to find ways into the system. And like I said, like I said, different systems have different levels of security. You've got a public facing web form that say maybe it's not a really highly critical system, but when you use the same password there as say for example in your email system, you leave that door open. So somebody had probed through their system and gotten the password of one of their senior vice presidents and then managed to log into the person's email account. And then, like I said, through different connected systems, able to find different ways through their network, and was able to gain access to a critical system by asking the password, by getting the password from the, from the, VP, from the VP's forum account. So he had tried to access another system, the password had been changed, so this guy, this hacker, emailed the IT group and said, look, I'm trying to access this system, he's playing the part of the VP. This is the old password. So he had that password. He says, can you guys let me know what the new password is so I can go and make some changes, make sure things are working right? And they gave it to him. So it's like that kind of a connected system. Like you talk about privacy, security, identity theft. Like people say identity theft is never gonna happen to me. How many people here have, say for example, left their Facebook account logged in and somebody's changed something on them or said, oh, I love my parents or I love my kids. There's a few people here. So as an example, just kind of keep that in mind. Like, Security at a lower level and security at a, at a large level, it's the same effect or same impact. It's just the effects of that on a long going term, you have to think about how it's gonna affect you in the future, how it's gonna affect different people in different organizations. Um, how am I doing for time here? 18 minutes, good. I won't keep you too long, sorry. <laughs> Another example of a, an attack here is, um, this one is extremely complicated, uh, South. Next wait. Uh, the South Korean communications. Um, the, their backend system, they had a, like an application development environment where, and you guys can look this up, I was reading about this this week and it's a pretty complex path, but I guess at a very high level, they had a web, uh, an application development system that somebody was able to hack into. And this application was something they delivered to many of their customers, like hundreds of customers. But in the back end, they put I guess for lack of a better word, a Trojan or a virus that said, when customer X installs the software, do something. Infect the system or connect to a website and say, look, I'm here. Um, and it was um, the application development company had provided the software to Seth Korean Communications. And when they installed their system, one system became infected, and then two, then three. And then the people that were doing this hacking were able to get control of those systems, but it's completely, they had hundreds of customers and none of the other customers saw this or even had the infection, but it was just this one customer that got this one build was infected and it's very, very complex and a very, very targeted attack. It's the planning, like they say from start to end of that attack took about six months. So you see this, this kid from Montreal goes away for school and he's attacking a website and he doesn't even realize he's doing it. That took all of 30 seconds. But this, in a planned environment or a planned attack, took six months, so you're gonna have to ask, what was the instigator of that? Who initiated that attack? Like, what was the reasoning behind it? It's, uh, you almost have to wonder if, at the level of national security, what if that was something that was targeted, say, like a financial institution, or the Dow Jones, or NASDAQ, and those systems were completely knocked offline for weeks at a time. The impact of that on the financial markets would be devastating.
One of the goals of Q1 Labs and the software, our software, QRadar, is to help people see these kinds of attacks. What's happening on their network, collecting information, like I said, from various different locations on the systems, and trying to give them a really good point of view as to what's happening on the network, at, ideally it's in real time. Typically what's happened is that you've got a vulnerability in your system, and there's a path of time between that vulnerability. Does it get fixed or doesn't get fixed? And if it doesn't, it gets exploited. Ideally, that's, that never happens, but sometimes it does. From the exploit, from the exploit, sorry, the next critical piece of time, the next critical component is how long it takes you to identify that issue and resolve it. If that's a matter of hours, it's not too bad. If it's a matter of days, weeks, months, somebody gets hacked and they're, they're left compromised for a period of that amount of time, the amount of information both that could affect financial, social, any kinds of aspects of common life, like what is the impact of that? So one of the things that we try to do at Q1 is to shorten the amount of time between the remediation of an issue or the exploitation of an issue and the remediation of an issue. And that's done by giving a customer as much information as we can, taking all these disconnected pieces of information from different sources in the network. I think the next slide, thanks. The, there's security devices on a network, for example, like firewalls. Um, network devices that are accessing, like a lot of the professionals here use VPN access to their network. So when they're at home, they're doing their own thing, they're checking their online accounts, they're checking what their grandkids are doing and what their children are doing. And say, for example, afterwards, they connect into their corporate network. So that is the kind of access to, from your personal to your private or your commercial life. Um, there's also systems on your network that when you log into a, a domain, those messages can be tracked. We can tie a specific person to a specific machine on the network. Like, if, for example, at the university, when a student logs into the system at the university, that generates a message into the network that can be tracked to say, user Dwight has logged into this system in this room. So that we can keep track of what these people are doing across the network. Uh, different applications that people run have an impact of what happens on the network as well. Say, for example, if you're using just a regular word processor, it's not a big deal. You're browsing certain websites, people are kind of curious what, what websites you're hitting. You're using peer-to-peer -peer software. A lot of policies say that, a lot of corporate policies say people can't run peer-to-peer -peer software. So that's the other kind of thing that kind of is kept track of. So from all these disconnected pieces of information, we pull out all these details. We run these details through an analysis engine, trying to figure out what's important, what's not, trying to separate the noise from the signal. Um, like I said, for example, we have a customer Chevron who has millions and millions of logs per day. For a person to look through that and try to find a problem, it's not gonna happen. What usually happens is that the guy that's running this application system says, okay, we've been hacked, we have to find out what happened. They come back through these terabytes and gigabytes and data of logs trying to figure out what the person did, where they came from, how long they've been there. So what Q1 does is it takes all those disconnected pieces of information, creates a single view. When these hacks occur, we identify the customer and say, okay, this has happened. Take a look at this. This is all the information. This is where they came from. This is what they were involved in. This is the network they came from. This is the applications they use. These are the other systems on your network that they were also trying to get into and query and tag. The goal, the goal of the software is to give an organization a single place where they can go look for this. Um, historically, people have dealt with different kinds of systems. They'd have to go to their application servers and see what applications are running and what people hit those. They go to their Windows domains or Novell servers trying to look through the, through the logs of who logged in and when. They have to go to the firewall, look through all the logs, see where the people came from, who was allowed in the network and who was denied. But now, with, this, with the software, they get all the information in one spot. They don't have to go running around spending hours and days trying to figure out what happened, where it happened, where it occurred, and who did it. Um, the, the goal now is to give them a single view as to what's happening and shorten that time between resolution, between exploitation and the resolution. And one of the things actually I was meant to mention, um, I was when listening to Dr. Grabani's presentation this morning and he's talking about the AIMS software um, one of the things that Q1 has done, kind of extending, it, our, our extending the software, is we now have a new component within the software that allows you to suggest a change that you're going to implement in your network. 
Say, for example, you're going to allow a certain, a certain other partner company to come into your network and access certain systems. What you can do is you can say, this is the change I'm going to make. This is where it's going to impact. What happens if I do this? So the system will look at all the traffic that's been collected. It'll look at all the systems on your network. It'll look at if, if you do vulnerability assessments. Anybody here on antivirus in their systems? They know that antivirus will report. You're going to see if not enough hands. <laughs> When the antivirus systems run, they can report that. So now we can take the antivirus data, we can take the vulnerability data, we can take what applications are running on your network, we can take what you're exposed to, where systems are coming from, and map that out to say, okay, if I change this, what will happen? And we give you, and it'll give you a view and say, these systems could be exposed. You look through the report and say, okay, that's okay, because these systems are not susceptible to any of these kinds of compromises but this particular system is. So it allows the person to say, okay, if we make this change, this, this could happen. So now they have the ability to respond to that, go fix that problem before they even make the change. So it kind of gives you this whole what if scenario. And it was uh, through the partnership with UMB and the Research Council that we're doing this. Um, ever since we've created Q1, we've tried to keep ties with the organizations in the Fredericton and the university has been one of them and it's been a great, it's been a great opportunity for us to learn from them and then to learn from us. Because not only do we learn from them about new capabilities and new concepts within research and managing security, managing networks, but they also get to see from us what customers are dealing with. Um, and even my, I myself, the problems that hit a customer, hit a user out there, I've been at Q1 for 10 years and I still see new things every day. Dealing with problems where I had a customer say to me one day that he was having a problem connecting to this system. And I said, okay, where is the system at? He says, well, we've got systems in this location in South America, we've got customs and we've got systems in North America, and we have some non-terrestrial systems. And I went, non-terrestrial? I, I couldn't figure out where that was. And he said, they're shipboard. But then he started talking about we have shipboard systems that are connected via satellite links. And I went, oh, I said, that's gonna cause a whole different raft of issues. Connectivity, bandwidth, just reliability of the communication between where his primary system was in the shipboard system. So when, when Mark was talking this morning and talking about getting connectivity while he was on a ship, I want to talk to him about that and figure out how we did that because that's a possible solution for this customer. But the issues that customers deal with, we feed, back that, feed that information back into the research organizations, let them see that and respond to that and come up with the ideas. It's, it's a win-win it's a situation for both groups. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, local partnerships. Um, like I said, we've been in Fredericton now for about 10 years. We've been building the company out since then. Um, we've got about 35 UMB graduates that work with us here in Fredericton and about 20 others that are from other institutions around the Maritimes. The, that's, oh, that's half of our staff in Fredericton. It's a great resource being here to be able to pull from the research community at UMB with Ali Gabrani's group, access to the great network that Fredericton's running here. We've, we do a lot of transfer of information between the groups, um, between ourselves. Um, we scrub our customer data, but then we allow the university to take a look at that and say, okay, here are six months worth of data. See what kind of patterns you can find in that. Um, and we do a lot of that communication back and forth across the Fredericton network. Go Fred. The, The team here has been a really good team. Um, we've started out with about six of us in 2000, 2001. Um, the company now, like I said, in Fredericton is about 120 to 130 people. Um, it's a very close-knit team here. Um, the team, they can, I've seen me call in, a, call in some problems uh, to our staff list at work, eight o'clock at night, and within half an hour, I've got answers from maybe five or six or seven people within our development team saying, check this, check this, check this. Um, A lot of people may wonder, how do we do this in Fredericton? How do we do this in New Brunswick? It was tough. Uh, when we started the company here, um, the names that Maurice called out, Dave McNeil, Greg Sprague, Jane Fritz, a lot of those people, Brian Kay. When we started Q1, we weren't quite sure, when we started the product, we weren't quite sure how we were gonna make out. Um, 
we worked hard get, trying to get it done. Like we were all, Chris and I and Sandy, we all worked full time while we were starting the company. We we're trying to figure out what direction do we need to take. So one of the things we learned really early on is that you have to know your strengths, you have to know your weaknesses. I can claim a weakness as public speaking, so I will mention that. The, when you can build it a good team around you, that team will help feed your passion for your company. It will help feed your passion for your project and the work you do. Um, we, uh, <laughs> I can remember some of our first business meetings with some of the team. We were trying to figure out, like, we would say, okay, we're going to write the software. You guys go find customers and we will get it in there. If you can find us a customer, we'll get the software installed, get it working, and they'll be happy with it. But it's tough. You can't, you can't underestimate how hard that is. Like I said, like my path through Q1 has been working in uh, development, pre and post sales support, and then working on the support side, dealing with customers kind of like on a one on one basis. And trying to make sure customers are happy with what you can offer, it's tough, especially if you're out there face to face. It's, you gotta be able to diffuse any sort of really volatile situation where they say that this isn't working. You have to be able to respond and get that working. And when you've got a really good team around you, it makes a big difference when you say, okay, I can't figure this out. You have to be able to say, I don't know. You have to, be able to tell a customer, tell a user, I don't know what the problem is. I will find you an answer, but I can't, find, I don't know that right now. You go back to your team, go back to your friends, go back to your colleagues and say, I need a hand with this. This is what's happening. Can you help out? And more often than not, you will get help. If you've got the, you've got the team around you that can work through that. Um, sorry. One other quick thing. Um, the goal, I guess, of uh, working with a team like this is to make sure that users are happy. Um, like I said, I've been at this 10 years, and I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, the team has grown worldwide around 300 people. I see a lot of people here today that I hope will be involved in organizations here in the province or here in Fredericton. And I wish you all good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> all right, have a seat, Mike. Uh, we've already got plenty of questions uh, oh, no. from, <laughs> yes, indeed, some tough ones too. But I, I want to start with one just out of my own curiosity. Is it something I said? No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to run away yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, what, what is the profile of the typical online attacker now? Has it changed? You talked about hacktivists and, you it's, know. Uh, it's, it's all over the map. The, like, for example, I was working with a customer just, today's Thursday. I can't remember the days anymore. Um, on Monday, they, one, of his, one of his users had said that they had had a probe. I was, this is kind of back to the whole forum thing and back-end applications being more secure than others. He had said that one of, his, one of his database admins had come to him and said, we've got something happening on one of our servers. We can't quite figure out what's going on. Mm. So he called us. And it's not typically something we get involved in, like, involved, like going through an investigation, but we helped them out, um, keep the users happy. And while we were watching the system, like his DBA came back and said, we've got people injecting stuff into our forum-based website, redirecting users to different sites. And I said, that's basically injection. They're injecting um, redirection, like cross-site scripting into the website. Mm -hmm. And while we were watching it, they cleaned it up, but the hole was still there. So as I'm watching the system, and we're watching traffic coming into the network, I see the probe come in again, and their database got infected again. I'm just, you guys got to go talk to the developer of this application and get this cleaned up. So what was the goal of that person? I don't know. It's getting harder and harder to scope out what the intent of an attack is. Like, is it monetary or is it just curiosity or is it somebody probing a system? And, so. and presumably, presumably you're dealing with a whole other level of, of attackers as well if what we believe is actually true about national governments. Yes becoming involved. That's the thing, you get it, the, the reason somebody does the attack, curiosity, revenge, monetary, but when you start thinking about different levels of what they're probing, what they're hitting, who's the instigator of that, who's the sponsor of that activity, it's a question I don't know if I want to entertain the answer to. It's just, <laughs> I, sometimes I have maybe a, a too positive an outlook, I think, that yeah. we should all just get along. 
<laughs> Sorry, that's probably that's a bit a great, naive. That's a great, a great <laughs> sentiment. Uh, unfortunately, I suspect the demand for Q1 Labs uh, true, uh, true uh, enough, abilities true. will, uh, will uh, continue for some time. Listen, let's get to some of the questions from the audience here. Uh, one question from Twitter. Um, how does all of the tracking you were talking about affect user privacy? Privacy. Um, mm -hmm. What privacy? Oh, well, it kind of depends on your institution, your organization that's using the software. For example, um, government users have a different, a different concept of privacy than a commercial organization. You work for a commercial organization, they own your time. Whatever you do in their network, they have rights to see everything. If you're, not, if you're doing something you're not supposed to, well, you probably shouldn't be doing that. So within a corporate environment, privacy is a little different situation. Um, Within a public environment, say for example, elected officials, it's, it's a different situation. So within a government controlled network, they have a different point of view as to what can be looked at, what can't be looked at. Like for example, we've had um, a, a government institution say that we have to basically block the ability to see payloads. So like our software can, can watch network communications and see your URL request, as long as it's not encrypted. Yeah. But within some, uh, within some government institutions, they say, we have to block that. You can't see. You can see where they're going, but not necessarily what they're doing. So there, there is different. It depends on the customer's point of view as to what information they're allowed to see and what they're not allowed to see. Uh, an interesting question here. How does Q1 Labs handle the plausibility of a threat from within Q1 Labs when you have access to so much insider information? Well, it's a great team. We don't have any bad people. <laughs> um, of course not. No, it's, it's, it's a good question. So. You have to have a certain level of confidence in the team you work with. You have to be able to, you have to, be able to trust them and say that they're going to do the right thing. Um, and that's the same within any organization, not just Q1. You basically make sure that the confidential information only goes to the people who are allowed to see it. Like for example, us in support, we have access to a lot more information than say our development team, our QA team. Um, because a lot of times our customers will ask us, what is this? Like I said, this example of, I have a customer call in and says, I'm getting attacked right now, can you help me out? So that, was, that was me. Yeah. Um, and I had one of the guys kind of going through it with me just to give him the experience of seeing that activity. But that was the only person. So when you think about the, comf the customer conf confidential information that's coming in, mm. a lot of times our customers will scrub that. They'll remove, like, they'll remove IP addresses so that people can't see that. They'll remove usernames. So while you may get the, the point of view of the activity, you don't necessarily know who it was. You can't tie it back to a person. Kind of anonymizing, I guess, the data. Let me ask you this, another question from Twitter. How could the Q1 software aid the school system and the district in keeping, maintaining safety, I presume is meant here, but also allow less limitations on research or fewer limitations on research? So you're going to have to think about what is, can you, re can you repeat that question again? Yes. How could Q1 uh, how could Q1 software, and I'll paraphrase here, help the school system and the district maintain safety online, maintain security, I, I take this to mean, but also allow for fewer limitations on research? Part of that would be to determine what a good policy is. Uh, and that's within a, within a, good, a information, good informational good policy, information. like what should, what should our users be doing? For example, like a, a research network, um, and we get this a lot of times, a lot of problem, a lot of, with a lot of our university customers that university networks are by design, they're research networks, and they want them completely open. So that leaves, that basically means you've left a lot of doors open. So the first thing we do is, okay, we monitor everything that's happening. Hmm. Granted, admittedly, that they don't have the policy to block everything, but we'll at least monitor what's happening. If something occurs, like I said, it comes back to shortening the, t the time between the exploit and the, and the remediation of that. Um, Keeping it safer. If you know what your users are supposed to be doing, then you can look for th look for behavior outside of that. Makes it, for example, you say you have a, a, a research network that all my people are always connecting out. They're talking to this group, this group, this group, this group. Um, but if there's a different a different institution, different remote site that gets involved, okay, you start to watch that. The team can watch that and say, okay, this is outside of our normal normal activity for this group of people. So you kind of have to you have to know your users and know what they're doing in a large school environment, like I think about university environment, it's relatively homogeneous or a, a smaller group, you can, there's certain points, but if you talk about like a public school system, 
monitoring a network that's as diverse as the public school system across the province, it could be tough. You have to make sure you get all the right piece of information into the system, watch what's going on and say, okay, these are what's happening, and you start to look for patterns in the traffic, and make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to. You know, as a parent, there are a lot of, there are a lot of students here, um, and, and I remember my days as a student, the most security I had to worry about was, you know, getting beaten up in the bathroom. Um, today, it's a very, very different world out there. Yeah. Um, and really, from, from much of what we read and hear from people in your field, as, as much as you work at ensuring there is security, really from a, a layperson's point of view, there isn't. You, you need to suspect Something's going something to is going to yeah. happen at every turn. So given that, how does a young person treat the, their access to technology uh, every time they venture out into that, uh, you know, into that area? Well, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> well, I, I, and my, my point is, that, is this. You're working to secure companies and institutions, institutions, but really the primary concern we all have is how we protect ourselves. Right. There was a question here, you know, what, what's the best software, the security software that you would recommend? So uh, as far as, like, like, like I said, our, our software is looking at a an organizational product, right. it's commercial, yeah. it's high level. Um, the best thing you can do is, like I said, it depends on your exposure. Right. How much do you do online? If you don't do anything online, you're probably relatively secure. Mm. Um, then it's like the next point, okay, if you, do more, if you have more activities online, if you're an avid social media user, you use online banking applications, online purchasing applications like eBay, Amazon, those mm. kinds of things. Make sure that what you do there is, that you, where, where, if you have access to sites, make sure that your passwords are secure. Right. Um, keep track of your own activity. Like say, for example, like I, sometimes I get surprised. I do a lot, I do a fair amount of purchasing online. Um, and Visa doesn't seem to trigger any of it. Hmm. Um, but occasionally there will be a purchase go through or something happens, they'll call me. And they'll say, this, this happened on your account. Is this right? I go, yeah, that was me. But it's happened once that where it wasn't me. And they yeah. called and they were able to track that down. So, and this, in part, is the point I'm getting at. We can't necessarily rely on others to look after, to look after our own security. Yeah. It's incumbent upon every individual to realize their own vulnerability. Right. Yeah. Like I said, you have to think about what your exposure is, what you're doing out yeah. there, and what, what you're opening yourself up to. Um, the internet, like I said, is, was fundamentally developed as a research network. Security has been added on to an extent afterwards. Yeah. That's the reason we exist, Q1, that there was a problem. We said, okay, we have to figure out what's going on. We looked at network traffic. We first started out looking at just network activity. And we found that the, while there was a need for that, there wasn't necessarily a business, like a business model or a marketplace for it because we were dealing with a lot of other competing products that had similar, similar goals. So then we started, okay, where, how far can we, where can we take this to? So we said, well, let's look at the security side of things, not just analysis of network, look at the security side of things. Let's start pulling information from authentication systems and IDS and pulled it in and look at that. So once we started collecting that and building the company, then we were able to say, okay, we've got a bigger product or a bigger, bigger solution for customers to use, for people to look at. Well, you've got fertile territory to plow for the, uh, <laughs> for the coming years, I'm sure. Ladies and gentlemen, Dwight Spencer, the co-founder and principal solutions architect at Q1 Labs. Thanks, Harry. Thanks very much, Dwight. Great job. We'll give you that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.